So if you have your Bibles with you, again, chapter 4 of Acts, we'll be starting from verse 1. Just to give you a little context, from last week, Pastor Dan touched on the lame beggar that was just healed. And all of a sudden, he, he's jumping, he's rejoicing, and these apostles, Peter and John, they're giving all the glory to Jesus. And they said, it was Jesus alone that performed this miracle. And they didn't take credit for themselves. They didn't take credit for, you know, their buddy, for the other buddy, and trying to say, hey, we did this pretty well. But they said, we're going to give glory to Jesus. But you see, when they gave glory to Jesus, there was a group of people called the Sadducees. And if anyone remembers the Sadducees, they had something against the resurrection altogether. And so when they're speaking about Jesus that supposedly they thought they killed, now they're bringing someone that was supposedly resurrected and performed the miracle that frustrated them, that annoyed them very greatly. And so what happened was that they took these men, John and Peter, and they took them and arrested them. I mean, think about this. You did, like, let's say you performed a miracle and all of a sudden you get arrested for doing something so wonderful. Wouldn't that be confusing? Wouldn't that be strange that they took you to the, the just local jail and just wanting to question you for performing? I, I mean, I hope that never happens here. <laughs> but it happened back then. But you see what happened was, they're now standing, and we're going to be questioned for what just happened. So just to give you a quick break breakdown before we start reading from verse 1, there's a few things that are going to happen if you're taking notes. From verse 1 through 6, it talks about them being approached, being arrested for performing a miracle. Verse 7 through 12, they're going to be questioned and, and trying to perform a defense by Peter specifically. Verse 13 through 22, they're going to be prohibited, and they're being threatened, and then 23 through 31, they give praise and they pray for more boldness. So let's start from verse 1 through 4. It says, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, and it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000 people. Come on. That's amazing for even a miracle being performed brought so many souls to Christ. I want you to listen very carefully what, what's happening here and kind of the context behind it. Listen, this takes place in the same year as the ascension of Jesus. This happens before the same high priests, Annas and Caiaphas, and Caiaphas is a son-in-law to Annas. They're greatly annoying the Sadducees because that's opposing their belief of resurrection in which they preach. They're exposing the lies of the chief priests because remember in Matthew 28, they bribed the soldiers, say, don't tell anyone that they stole or don't tell anyone that he was resurrected. Just say that they stole the body. So they're exposing their lies. The fifth thing is that they preach salvation exclusively through Jesus alone, and no other religion or God can do so. The seventh thing is that the same Jesus whom they thought they buried apparently didn't only demonstrate the bread multiplication, but now became the soul multiplication because he was the bread of life. Come on, listen very carefully. What you sow, be careful what you sow because you're going to reap it. They thought they took care of the matter by burying Jesus in the grave. But you see, Jesus went from the five loaves, the two fish, to feed the 5,000 physically. He went from the seven loaves and a few fish to feed the 4,000 physically. But when this one man, Jesus, the Messiah, was buried in the grave, he fed 5,000 souls spiritually. You see what, a death, what the death of Jesus has done in the history of mankind. Come on, are there any people like the apostles here that just, as you're already annoying someone, you're just increasing the heat? Is there any someone that performed maybe some trouble in your schools and like you're getting in trouble, but they're just kind of turning up the heat and say, we're going to crank it up even more and they're going to hate me even more probably. Do you know this is exactly what they were doing? They were making them more frustrated. They are preaching the word they could have kept it hidden. They could have said that was us. They didn't have to bring up Jesus, but they pointed to Jesus. But now, look carefully what's happening here. Is this any different from today? 
Let's take a look at what happens today. We have the same Holy Spirit and power as back then. We preach the same gospel to the world. The world is annoyed of by Christianity, whether it's persecution in China, whether it's the hate speech in Canada, or the non-inclusiveness in the United States. Come on, we're, there's the exposing of the darkness of the demonic agendas in the government, whether it's the left wing, the right wing. All I know is that I want to be under the shadow of the Almighty's wing. And there's the witches and the warlocks inspired music industry and the latest release so doesn't, releases doesn't have to be, doesn't matter whether it's the Swifts, the Doges, or the Gagas. What we need is the gospel, the true music that brings life and hope, not depression and failure and destruction. We're going to continue to expose these demonic agendas and it doesn't matter if it's the ABCs of identities out there saying, I was born this way. You know, Jesus says, you must be born again. Even if you think you were born this way. But you see, the gospel needs to be preached. And even the, 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 the struggle that they were going through back then, we're facing the same things. But we have one promised thing that remains the same. The power of the Holy Spirit that's inside of us. Hallelujah. You see, we also, we also preach that Jesus is the only way. And you hear people respond with sometimes, well, you're brainwashed. You know, Jesus said you need, you need to be renewed in your mind because ever since the beginning, Satan lied to the great-great-great-grandfather, Adam and Eve. We need the renewal of our minds, even if they think we're brainwashed. We all need the, the, the cleanliness of our minds. They could respond with, well, there's many ways to God. You know, Jesus said that it's going to be a narrow way. They could also respond with, well, you're not being inclusive of diversity and other religions. You're right. We preach Jesus exclusively because he's the only way, the truth, and the life. You see, we preach the same Jesus who was killed, he was buried, and raised to life. And people today are still being saved, still being healed, still being delivered, still being set free. His body, the bread of life that was sown into the ground, is still bringing multiplication of the souls. Come on, you cannot stop the work of God. He is the same as yesterday, today, and forevermore. You see what happened here in Matthew 15 through 16, 15, Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. It says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. You see, this, these verses are speaking about being the lamp in the place that you're positioned in. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. Come on, we're called to be the light. We're called to be bold, even in the midst of opposition. So really, a question for each one of us today. Where has God positioned you today? In that moment, John and Peter were positioned in a place of opposition. They were taken to jail. You see, some of us are not going to jail, hopefully none of us, even for the sake of the gospel. But we will have moments where we will be pressured in the pressure cooker, being questioned, why are you doing this? Why are you believing in the Jesus whom you proclaim? So where has God positioned you where you might be required to answer for the faith that's inside of you? I mean, at the end of the day, we're in a church building. We're, we're in a place where we worship Jesus, so we'll have to answer why we come here in the first place. Who are you surrounded by in your workplaces, in your school, in your household? They might ask you about Jesus. Who's on your social media platform, whether it's a friends list or a followers list? What are they seeing Based on your life, are they seeing Jesus? What if they message you and ask you, can you tell me more about your faith? Can you tell them? You see, I want you to get this. Everything you're surrounded by will always, again, will always try, attempt, pressure, search out, investigate to determine your positioning. Are you for Jesus or are you against Jesus? I mean, this is getting someone, someone out of their comfort zone. We will have moments like that where you just have to share what is inside of you. I remember my second day on the job, a new job that I started. This was very recently. We had a team offsite. They call this a team offsite because they fly some people in, and we have just like a very long meeting that you get very tired, you get hungry, but praise God, they feed you some food there, so, and it's free. Praise the Lord. Who likes free food? <laughs> 
So they take care of that, and it's wonderful food. So we get through our long meetings and long agendas, and all of a sudden, towards the end of the day, maybe around 4 p.m., and I mean, people are getting tired, and uh, we're wrapping up, and there's going to be a team dinner that's happening at the end, which is great. That's paid for, too. But what happened was, this is really strange, and I'm just trying to get to know who these people are, and the VP, so the vice president of our team, pretty, pretty high up there, he said something very interesting. He said, hey, guys, I'm so sorry, but this happened, this, this is kind of the second year in a row, but I won't be able to make it to dinner with you guys as much as I want to. I'm fasting. <laughs> what came to my mind is he's definitely not Christian because <laughs> Christians wouldn't publicly de- declare that very boldly like that. <laughs> so I said, hey, uh, you're probably not Christian, huh? Because we Christians do, we say that privately. We don't really say it. I'm kidding. I didn't tell him that. I don't want to get fired. <laughs> you see, that's not the point. There's a place and a time to say it respectfully if needed. And the first week they already knew I was Christian. And glory to God for that. But you see, there will be moments where you will be required to share your faith. I share that story on purpose because think about he could have lasted very just fine through breakfast, just fine through lunch, and no one would have known that he's fasting. But there was a time where his presence was necessary. And it was in the evening. People would have asked, where is he at? I mean, come on, he's the big boss in charge in the same room. There will be moments as the same way where we will have to say what's inside of us. Are you ready to say it? Are you ready to stand boldly for Jesus? Are you ready to share your faith with others? Let's continue reading verse 10 through 12. It says, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven among men, given among men, by which we must be saved. You see these words that Peter spoke? These were words inspired by the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. So I want to draw you a quick distinction between the the two concepts we hear at times. There's receiving the Spirit. There's the filling of the Spirit. Receiving the Spirit is the Spirit of God in you. happens at salvation. Filling of the Spirit, it happens through you. The Holy Spirit's ministering and using you. It's when you yield. You see, when you receive the Spirit, the Spirit's in you. He's in you, he resides in you, and he seals you for salvation. Being filled with the Spirit is when he's working through you and activates you and manifests through you. He's using you. So in this moment, Peter was saved. But the Holy Spirit it has filled him to speak exactly the words that he needed to say. And oftentimes pierced the hearts of men. And he spoke with such boldness. He says, there's salvation in no other name. I mean, he's preaching it, and he's speaking it by the Spirit of God. And some of us here might say, well, that was Peter. I'm not Peter. What do I say? Let me comfort you really quick. And Matthew 10, 19, it says, do not worry what to say and how to say it, for in that time, the Holy Spirit will speak through you. You see, regardless of the circumstances, the places that we're in, the Holy Spirit is your covering. The Holy Spirit fills you, and he will come upon you. And you think, come on, now, Holy Spirit, now, now. Listen, he'll do it in the perfect timing, but when he does it, there's so much power that goes through you and that it'll pierce the hearts of men and women. Hallelujah. You see, there's four things that Peter touches on. It's being filled with the Holy Spirit. He publicly declares the healing of God's, that, that, that was by God's power. Jesus is the healer, not their own doing. That Jesus, number two, that Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. The third thing is that Jesus is the cornerstone. And that number four, salvation is in no one else, no one under heaven. Not one man was given authority and power to save except Jesus Christ. You see, the beauty of it all in 1 Peter 3.15, it says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give reason for the hope that is in you, that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. 
There's a quote that one person said, It is better by noble boldness to run the risk of being subject to half the evils we anticipate than to remain in cowardly littleness for the fear of what might happen. Let me touch really briefly on what Peter, touching on the cornerstone, he was referring to Jesus. Peter's really preaching about the cornerstone, and he's mentioning the cornerstone, but he's also doing what he's preaching. He leans on the word, not his own understanding. He's putting his life and eternity into the hands of Jesus because Jesus is the head, the co- head of the corner and the head of the body of Christ. That means he's in charge. The rock upon which the weight of the whole structure is laid upon. So Peter uses that concept of the cornerstone even in the midst of opposition, even in the midst of the pressure that he's facing. And he says, I'm going to lean on the cornerstone and I'm going to trust in Jesus. You know, some of us here, We've tried to do that in our own strength. We try to reply to people in our own strength. But what if we leaned on the cornerstone? What if we place all of the weight on the Holy Spirit to save, to heal, to deliver, and set the captives free? Because when you speak the word of God, you are tapping into the limitless power. Let me say it again. When you speak the word of God, you are tapping into the limitless power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a... um, there's a story of, of this man, he, Dr. Deal, uh, Deal Moody once was asked, why was he constantly seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit so many times? I mean, the response, he says, is because we leak so many times. Really, if you think about it like a cell phone, we constantly have to plug it into the wall. We constantly have to keep it charged so that we can use it because it's a very powerful tool. Now, think about this concept. What if we... We're always connected with the Heavenly Father, being in sync with the Holy Spirit because we're constantly recharging our connection with God. Allowing the filling of the Holy Spirit to use us wherever we go and let Him release the words of God, which is the limitless power of God. Would you not want to lay all the weight on Jesus in your conversations? Would you trust the Holy Spirit to preach His message? It's His, anyways. It's you leaning on the cornerstone to deliver the cornerstone message. You're yielding. Again, your yielding is a reflection of your filling of the Holy Spirit. You see, our theological, our intellectual, sophisticated, full of experience type of answers sound pretty good. But the Holy Spirit's answer is much better. You see, we can try to penetrate the minds of people but the Holy Spirit can reach down deep into the hearts of men and bring them to repentance. You see, our job is not to convert, but to declare the word of God. That's the miracle working power in itself. The power of God will transform lives. That's what it's meant to do. Hallelujah. Come on, let's keep reading Acts chapter 4. So verse start, continuing on with verse 18 through 20. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John asked them, answered them, and they said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They said, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. You see, I mean, if you look at this court case, really, They knew that they lost. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, all these high priests, they knew that they lost this court case because they're like, hey, these are uneducated men. They're common men. They're Jesus type of people. So they're not not very strong. They can't necessarily do too much. And when they saw that they're lacking accusations, they couldn't even deny that this man, by the way, that was standing right next to them with them in that court case, literally this man that was lame now is walking. I mean, how can you deny that? And so they used a power tactic in saying, you know what? Let's just scare them. Let's prohibit them. Let's threaten them. Let's just say that you cannot ever do this again. But you say, you see what happened is? What was their why? Why were they willing to stand and even lay down their lives? I mean, they could have pulled up a cross again and hanged both of these men as well. They were willing. 
They were willing to lay down their lives on the altar for the name of Jesus. They couldn't deny that this man, I mean, if you think about it, if they denied the miracles that they saw, Jesus, all the healings that Jesus performed, all the salvations, they would have been lying to themselves. But they couldn't do that. So that's why they said, we cannot but speak what we have heard and have heard. My question is, what is your why? What is your why for being in here? What is your why for being a Christian? What is your why for your faith in Christ? What is your why when you're questioned about your faith? What is your why when you, they ask you, can you tell me a little bit more about your church? I would say, ah, it's okay, it's in that corner. Uh, no, can you tell me more about your church? Can you tell me more about Jesus Christ? Listen, I want the forgiveness you've received. Can you tell me a little bit more? You see, the world's desperately looking for answers, and you have that answer because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and that's the only one that can satisfy what they're longing for. Peter Carwright, a 19th century circuit-riding Methodist preacher, was an uncompromising man. And one Sunday morning, when he was about to preach, he was told that General Andrew Jackson was in the congregation and warned not to say anything out of line. That sounds familiar. When Cartwright stood to preach, he said, I understand Andrew Jackson's here, and I've been requested to be guarded in my remarks. Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he doesn't repent. The congregation was shocked and wondering how the general would respond. He was known for being a very hot-tempered man. After the service, General Andrew Jackson shook the hands with Peter Carter and said, Sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could whip the world. If I had a regiment of men like you, I could have whipped the world. You see, there's people that are wanting to hear the truth. They're willing to be rebuked, in, in, in other words. They're willing to hear the truth because they're wanting change. Will we withhold or are we going to be bold to speak the truth? I want to remind you and I ask you this question, what is your why? Peter Cartwright knew his answer. What is your why? I want to remind you that as a son and daughter of God, you possess a lot more than you realize. You see, we talked about the filling of the Holy Spirit, being sealed with the Holy Spirit. Did you realize that the Holy Spirit is the fullness of God? Did you realize you have everything that God ever intended for you? Did you realize that when you are born again and saved and you, you, you know, people that are sitting here that, are, that know Jesus, you have the limitless power inside of you. So in other words, there could be a line of Judah that can roar against the enemy. Are you willing to let him roar through you? In other words, let him say the truth through you. Let him release whatever he has for the people that are longing to hear it. Come on, let's wrap up with a few more verses, verse 29 through 31. And then we're going to come to prayer. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and the signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word with all boldness. You see, these Disciples could have sat back and accepted the fact that they tried it once, but rather they continued to pray to continue. They wanted to continue to do that work. They could have accepted the threats and the fear to penetrate them, but rather they continued to permeate the regions with the gospel. They could have enjoyed that one healing and said, that was wonderful. Whew, we're still alive, and that was great. But rather they said, Jesus, we want more. Come on, is there anyone here in this place that, Jesus, we want more? I know that place could have been tough. I know that circumstance could have put me under a lot of pressure. But Jesus, that's who you've called me to be, to be a witness. And you're going to help me do it. They could have enjoyed receiving the Spirit and sit quietly. But rather they wanted to be filled with the Spirit and the place was shaken. You see, what about you and I? What is your prayer this morning? What are you longing for? 
You see, you could sit back and accept the fact that being bold is for others. Or you can get up and pray for boldness. Maybe you're afraid that you might not get that paycheck if you stand up for the truth. And they'll say, hey, you're not being inclusive. You're not, you're not being the example that you need to be at work. What if? What if standing for the truth, what if it's worth it for the sake of your workplace and the neighborhood because they need to hear Jesus? What if your appetite for the power of God went from one miracle to see hundreds of miracles, signs and wonders? Will you ask Jesus to fill you and use you? I think this is going to turn into the, the days of Acts if that happens. If each one of us comes to the Lord this morning and say, Lord, do it again. Jesus, we want more of you. I know it could be scary to shine the light of Christ. I know it could be scary to be placed in a similar position as Peter and John. But at the end of the day, you've called me to be that witness and you will give me that strength. What if you were meant to shake the place with the truth of God's word and power and you finally let go? We're going to let go of our undercover Christian roles. We're going to put those cloaks down. We're going to remove those masks for the glory of Jesus, let us, reflect the, let us reflect Christ and really take the role of a Christian, the one who follows Christ. You see, here's a very important key that you need to remember. The key in every single thing that they did and being successful, even standing before the chief priests and Pharisees, whoever it is that they're opposing and stirring some heat, is that they ask Jesus for help. Listen, they weren't some kind of confident people and trying to say, hey, look at me. Look what I can do. These people say, Jesus, help us. This is not a confidence game. This is a humility approach and saying, Jesus, we cannot do this without you. I mean, is there someone here this morning that wants to say the same thing as Jesus? I can't live this life without you altogether. I can't be that light that you've called me to be if it's not for you. You see, the key and the answer for all of this is that when they asked, they asked Jesus. And you're going to ask this morning, and Jesus will do it. And Jesus will give you the boldness. And Jesus will help you shine the light of Christ. And Jesus will give you the strength. You see, I love the reminders in Corinthians. It says we have such a hope that we are very bold. Hebrews says the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Romans said for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Romans also says if God is for us, who can be against us? You and I have a greater hope than we realize. It's a matter of knowing. Ask. Ask Jesus this morning to give you that strength and to give you that faith. I want to wrap up with a quick summary as far as what we touched on. I mean, come on, point number one. We need to shine our light brighter. I know Peter and John clearly pointed to Jesus. They understood the risk. Are you willing to shine your light brighter this morning as you walk out of this room? The second point is that there's the reason for the hope that needs to be shown. Peter and John, when they were questioned, they said, we hope in Jesus because he is our salvation. He is our help and he performed the miracle. Will you walk out of this place saying, this is the reason for my hope? This is why I'm sitting here in this place. This is the reason I work in the hospital, in the business office, in the, in the, in the place of construction, because I need to shine Jesus. Will you tell them the reason for your hope? The third thing is, will you take a stand? You see, Peter and John, they were threatened and prohibited to speak, but they understood that God's power, God's authority is much higher. They're going to continue to preach, continue to share the word. And the fourth, as a way of reminder for us, is that wherever we are and whatever we do, we're there to permeate that space, is to influence that area, whether it's online or offline, whether it's in a grocery store, in the workplace, wherever it's at, in our families, we're there to shine the light of Christ. And therefore, we're going to be praying for boldness because that's what the apostles did. That's the only way we'll be able to do it. 